WNYC-TV presents About the Arts with Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Welcome to About the Arts. I am Barbara Lee Diamondstein. We have two distinguished guests with us today. The Whitney Museum of American Art is currently exhibiting the work of Jasper Johns in a retrospective of 22 years of the artist's work. And our guests today are two remarkable fellows, both museum professionals who mounted this important show. Tom Armstrong, the director of the museum, and David Whitney, the guest curator of the exhibit. A very warm welcome to both of you. Thank you. David Whitney, you are no relation to the founders of the museum, I trust. Uh, not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> Any that you know of? Not that I know of. Still uh, searching, though, right? <laughs> 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 However, you were the guest curator of the show. You have a long line of qualifications, one of which is perhaps little known, and that is that you were the one-time assistant to Jasper Johns. What is an assistant to an artist, especially one of such exacting standards and such rich versatility as Jasper Johns? What did you do? Uh, oh, I did all kinds of very glamorous things. I made coffee, or <laughs> I answered the phone, or I went to the store and bought paint or something. It was just whatever Jasper needed doing. Mm -hmm. During what period was this? I don't remember. It must have been around 1960, or oh, it was 1967, 68, I think. Well, you've been involved in the art world in a number of capacities. You've worked at galleries. You've even directed your own gallery. In all of these roles, how does your current role as a guest curator compare to that of a gallery, either employee or director? Uh, I guess it's all really the same to me. It's all just work. It's, uh, I mean, it was, it's, it's fun doing the show, but it's really mainly just taking care of millions of details and being well organized. It's uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, that's what it's about. You must have um, some opinions, Tom, about how the work of a gallery dir director differs from a museum director or curator. Or is that less and less? Well, David's right that the under, I think the, the basic, it boils down to what he says is being well organized. Um, their pressures are entirely different on you, I think. A gallery director uh, is in business and is selling art. It must be uh, easier to be a gallery director. I think it right? must be, too. We don't have all those trustees. <laughs> <looking> <laughs> the right. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> all those people like a director. And uh, and you're underpaid. If you continue that, he's going uh, to be a gallery director. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Listen, it's happening every day. <laughs> Jasper John's work has been a major influence for a long time now. Why did you choose this time for a retrospective? How did that come about? Perhaps you can start by answering, David. You have to talk to the boss. He started it. We started it three years ago, and um, I really felt it would be approximately 10 to 11 years since the Jewish Museum had presented the first 10 years of Jasper's work, and that it was time. There was a whole generation of people who really didn't know his work that well, and that it was time to present um, a comprehensive look at this artist who had grown to be internationally acclaimed as one of the great painters of the 20th century, great artists of the 20th century. Well, you've accomplished that brilliantly. All of you, Jasper primarily, with this the assist of, the of uh, <laughs> both of you. What was your central concern in organizing this show, David? Uh, excellence, I guess. I just wanted to be as good as it could be. Yeah. How many works yeah. are there, and over what period of time do they range? There are 201 things, and they range. The earliest thing in the exhibition is 1955. And what is that work? It's uh, the, f the first uh, American flag painting. And it's what's in, uh, one of the things that's interesting to me about it is that the, the work is uh, all mixed together uh, because I, I think Jasper's so good in, in different media. 
Perhaps uh, you should define more carefully for people who are as not as familiar with the organization of museum shows, why it is such an original departure, what you have done, the manner in which you have organized the show. Most shows are organized, I guess, uh, in terms of media. Yeah, I guess they are. And I just thought with Jasper that it was more appropriate to mix it together because he gives the same amount of attention and care to the making of a lithograph or a drawing or a piece of sculpture that he does to a painting. Um, it seemed appropriate to have them mixed together. So that yours is chronological. In yeah. any specific period you will show paintings and lithographs and... And drawings. And drawings as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. And sculpture. It's really very rare for... Um, to present an artist and present a mixed presentation, a, a, a mixed uh, survey of, of the media that he's worked in, especially prints. I mean, to hang prints next to paintings. Mm -hmm. and, Sounds uh, it's like a taboo in most museums. Well, no, I have, I've dealt with curators who wouldn't hang drawings with sculpture, for instance. And why? And, for what reason? Well, there's a sort of, there has been, I think, historically, a kind of hierarchy of importance. And how does that go? Paintings and sculpture on a line, I guess, and then drawings and prints. What you say? Exception. But Jasper has been so instrumental in raising the level of of accomplishment in the printmaking field, and is extremely well respected for what he's done. And so it's very important to present them um, to show. And also, he's a wonderful artist to do this with because he's dealing in compositions and in certain ways that, that travel through the media, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he reuses images. I mean, in, in one place in the exhibition, there's a coat hanger drawing that he made, and then uh, a couple of rooms later, a, a print that he made that's similar, and, but all of the themes carry th through. One of uh, the recurring images in John's work is the flag. The earliest of which you mentioned was the 1955 one right. shown in the current exhibit. What is the genesis of that flag painting? I've always consider it, considered it uh, a tribute to the force of John's art, artistry that he could take such a universal and impersonal symbol and make it genuinely his own. What is the genesis of the flag painting and why has it recurred? Well, according to Jasper, he had a dream and that he painted an American flag and he got up the next day and did it. Um, then uh, it became a fascinating image to him and he has gone back to it and treated it in different ways since then. How do you compare that image of his flag, for example, to de Kooning's woman, a recurring theme that becomes almost a scaffolding, a given to resolve technique? Oh, I think it's a different case, really. I mean, de Kooning uh, is basically a landscape or figurative painter, I think. Uh, I mean, it's a concept rather than an expression. Well, except that, I mean, I think it's a sort of obsessive subject matter with de Kooning. I think Jasper comes to it and uh, deals with it always in his own very controlled way. Uh, I don't Do you think there's an emotional content to the de Kooning woman that doesn't exist in the John's flag, I mean, between the artist and, and the subject? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, think I think so. Jasper uses the flag as a, I mean, I think it, it's been said that he uses the flag because of its reductive quality, so that he can then build on it in his own way. I mean, right, it's a that's what I object. meant is the scaffolding. Yeah. Right, and de Kooning is, is slashing away some woman. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there are certain recurring, other recurring images in John's work. Uh, what comes to mind are the targets, the beer cans. Uh, can you talk about some of them? Well, he's especially interested in technique. I assume that's how some of those plaster heads came about. Well, I don't know that he's especially interested in technique. I think he has a unique knowledge of how different materials work. And uh, he has a great awareness of, of different art materials, and he uses ones that, uh, I mean, with, you're using the example of de Kooning, who I think he tends, I think he probably tends to use oil paint all the time. 
And Jasper's always got some new medium he's found, whether it's, you know, been intended for arts and crafts or something that he wants to try. And he always is able to master a, a, a new and strange medium and do something with it. Michael Crichton points out in the catalog, by the way, when new images enter Jasper's work, and it's, um, and it's usually accidental. I mean, it seems sort of like a happenstance. Well, I mean, riding through Harlem and seeing the... Well, we might use this patterns, as an example. Oh, seeing a car. The barber down. tree, the work that is... some of the evolution of the work that is uh, reproduced on the cover of the catalog was certainly a... It's a photograph of a man painting a tree in the manner of no, a that, barber it, pole. It, it turns out that isn't, I mean, that isn't the story. It's, it's, what happened was Jasper first saw what he took that image from, mm -hmm. which was a, a car on the Long Island Expressway that had been painted similarly to that. The, the barber's tree was not the first in that bunch of paintings. It comes from a, a photograph in the National Geographic of a South American barber painting a tree in front of his uh, shop. In the fashion of a barber pole. Well, somewhat. Yes. The, the lines were different, but the lines related somewhat mm -hmm. to what Jasper was doing. But I think mainly what he got from that was the color. I mean, he, ba he based it somewhat on the color that the, the barber was using. But that isn't where the image was done for the first time. Another unusual departure in this show is the catalog text that was written by Michael Crichton, the same Michael Crichton of Andromeda Strain fame. How did that come to pass? Well, I vowed I'd never discuss this, but I guess <laughs> we're off and running. No, uh, when you're dealing with an artist like Jasper Johns, whom art historians have made very strong statements about, like Leo Steinberg, Max Kozlov, Barbara Rose. We wanted to add something to the literature. Um, and also, as we were working on the exhibition, as we began to think about it and so forth, and talk about it with other people, I suddenly realized that there's a huge public that simply does not respond and here I go, uh, w w to, to art language. They don't have, unfortunately, the education of American art in this country is so deficient that they don't have the, the preparation to approach art historical language. And we felt that to discuss this man and, and his work in a way which could be, we hoped, intelligible to someone who didn't have the necessary backup that is required, uh, that we would deal with a popular writer a man who is used to writing for a uh, popular consumption. A writer who is also a collector? He's a collector and he's been a friend of John's. He's known him for, for a while and um, has collected his work, has lived with his work, understands it. And uh, this, of course, is greatly subject to criticism from art historians because they consider artists and the artist's world and the artist's work their territory to deal with to the other world. And, um, you know, I haven't got started getting the hate mail, but the hate is flying around out there because we did this. And um, so far, the response from the non-art historical critical world has been very good because Michael has written a very intelligible and extremely revealing text. Well, you refer to several brilliant art historians, all of whom are quoted in Michael Crichton's text at some length. And territorial imperative aside, and I'm very sympathetic to the art historian in general, but as a, myself a non-art historian and a reader of catalogs, I found it not only edifying, but very interesting. It, I was reminded of Michael Crichton's medical training because there is such a precise and analytical nature to uh, the introduction that I think I would really commend it. I don't commend it in lieu of a Leo Steinberg monograph. No, no, no. I see it as supplementary material that is one of the most insightful profiles uh, in delving into one man's view of the way a very complicated, personal, uh, hermetic kind of artist works. And from that point of view, it no, is it's indeed it's interesting. It's, that's a very good way of putting it. It is a supplement to, to the other writings on this artist. And I deal with a... A museum director deals with a particular kind of audience. 
and I'm very anxious to educate that audience to a certain extent, and um, I think this text is educational. One of the most widely discussed questions in the art world is one that you have in part touched on, and that is the future direction and functions of museums. Some see uh, what role, you know, in general, should museums fulfill? Should they be educational institutions? Should they be citadels of the elite? Where do you see museums going in general, and the Whitney in particular? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Why don't you answer? Museums in general. Museums in general. Well, we all hope they survive. Um, as we know, many are not because the patronage base is, has um, many of those related to, this, to city funding have been in terrible trouble throughout this country. Museums, I think, are becoming uh, much more involved with, with the taste of a broader range of taste, a broader range of acceptability by a, a much larger public. I still think that museums, however, must establish standards. I don't believe in them in citadels. I don't believe in them as, as um, residents of the elite. Uh, that's one of the problems with the, many of the boards. David talked about boards of trustees. That's one of the problems with many boards of trustees because they, uh, many museums, in cities where there are singular museums, where you have the, a museum with the city's mm -hmm. name, where it is the museum, it then becomes a, a sort of symbol of accomplishment to arrive on that board, to be invited to be on that board. Well... Does that still hold true, or is that true for an earlier America, when our concerns perhaps were not as socially, uh, as broadly socially activist as they are now? I think it's true still, but I think it's, v it's so unrealistic that people are beginning to realize that it's really the, the end of a public institution. If if the trustee doesn't accept the public function, which is the survival of that institution and, and its programs. But where are museums going? I couldn't possibly tell you. The, the profession is in an uproar. Um, there are, well, we all know the Met's looking for a director. The Art Institute of Chicago has just chosen Alan Shestak as the director who used to run the Yale Art Gallery. First-rate person. A first-rate person, absolutely. Uh, the Corcoran is looking for a director. People are leaving museums to go into other professions. Does it's this get complicated by the new problem, and that is the conversation and the activity that, for example, the Metropolitan is engaging in now, the question of the two-headed museum, one an art historian and one an administrator? How do you think that would work in museums? You might be especially suited to respond to that, and we'll know more in a moment why. <laughs> I, I don't think it'll work. I think it's a very serious problem, and I think it... Um, I spoke once somewhere like Wilmington, and somebody came up to me and said, you really don't like trustees. That's not true at all. But I, I, think, I think in those institutions where, they're, where the administrative head, where the man responsible for the financial condition of the institution is now becoming the primary person has a great deal to do with the fact that the trustees have transferred that role to the administration of the museum. Are you saying there is a question of bottom lines that determine scholarship so that it is often box office versus scholarship, or the fact that uh, the person who controls how money is expended, if not directly, indirectly, makes aesthetic determinations? I, I don't want to get into the box office. I think that's, that's a way of sort of reducing it to, to popular terms. Uh, the situation is if you have an administrator who is not capable of making aesthetic decisions, and he is making the primary decisions over a, I mean, he directs a man under him. Um, and, th and the business of the museum is aesthetic judgments. Where are you? when you come to what to buy, whom to support, what the education program will be, that sort of thing, the direction of the museum. It, too many influences enter into it that shouldn't be considered if the head of it is an administrator. 
And I think staffs really resent it. Professional people resent this tremendously. Uh, you've had a situation in Chicago where this existed. You have a situation presumably on the way at the Met. And I think the staffs of, of these museums are very upset. Why don't we ask this professional person, uh, do you confirm uh, Tom's view? What's your opinion about this two-headed, what do you call a two-headed troika? <laughs> two-headed troika? A duet. I don't know what you yes, call this, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't really have an answer. I think do you that, have an opinion? Uh, no, I don't, I really don't. One of the reasons that I said that Tom was particularly suited to reply to this question of uh, administrative head versus art historian is he, in various times in his life, has been both. It's about 11 or 12 years ago that there you were, uh, was it a Wall Street businessman? Mm. How do you end up being... <laughs> you, you have a new view of him. <laughs> now you know why it's the only museum that is running in the black. No, 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 no. Not red, that was last red. week. No, no. <laughs> that was we last are week. in the red. <laughs> Hear that, New York State Council? <laughs> <laughs> Very much in the red. Um, but you are in the pink. No. And before that, how did a man who 11 years ago was a businessman end up being the director of the country's foremost museum of American art? Luck. It was all being in the right place at the I'm right sure time. Sure, wasn't pushing. <laughs> it was what a was lot of ambition. <laughs> I'm an overachiever. <laughs> but uh, what were some of those pla uh, places that you were in? I was head of the Rockefeller Folk Art Collection, in Williamsburg, Virginia. That is right where I couldn't achieve, um, and so I went on and um, became the director of the Pennsylvania Academy. In fact, while you were at the Pennsylvania Academy, which I guess is the nation's oldest museum and art school of its kind, you also initiated, I guess, its great expansion program. That's right. When I went to the Pennsylvania Academy, there was an architect in Philadelphia who wouldn't want this known, that, who was going to buy the building and turn it into his studio because one of the trustees wanted to take the collection and put it into a building that he was building and distinguish that building. And here you had a great 19th century eclectic structure by Frank Furness. Um, that, should, that was considered by Philadelphians a musty old Victorian structure. What they didn't realize is that they had a, a really primary example of 19th century American architecture. And they saved it. It was great. Well, you had a great part in that, too. And you came to New York, I guess it's three or four years ago now? I became the director three years ago. I came three and a half years. How have things changed in the period that you've been here? Um... Barbara Rose says, I've gotten self-confidence. Um, and the museum hasn't gotten much worse. <laughs> no, it's oh. been surviving. Uh, how, how have things changed? Um, I don't know. I think the museum, the museum has changed. And I'm very much criticized for changing it. But it's, it's changed in a way that I think it had to change. It, and how would you describe that change? It's, it's assumed a sort of tougher role in terms of of presenting what David was talking about before, choosing Jasper John's work. He was looking for excellence. And that is our primary consideration. Well, you've certainly reflected that in your plans for the rest of the year. You are about to, I guess, mount the first museum retrospective of Saul Steinberg. That's right. And when does that take place? It takes place in the spring. And we're very much anticipating it. Harold Rosenberg has written that catalog. And um, I haven't seen the text yet, but there have been long conversations between the three of us, and it's wonderful to be included in those when those two men talk, because there's a great understanding between them. And I think that uh, it'll be an outstanding exhibition. Well, I'm eager to see that. I guess most everyone is c very much concerned about museums' future direction, and very practically about museum funding where to get it, how to best spend it, and the rights and the responsibilities of both the donors and the recipients. This particular exhibit was co-sponsored by both the National Endowment for the Arts and by Philip Morris. What influence does a corporation or the government who gives money for a specific exhibit have on the final presentation of that exhibit? Zero, didn't you say? Yes, 
Yes, on the exhibit. Uh, sure. The, uh, the, I mean, one never hears another word from the National Endowment. They send their money very nicely, and that's the last you hear of them. And uh, with, a, with a sponsor, I think it's always more complicated because they want a certain amount of involvement. Uh, but not in, the, not in the choice of the, the paintings or anything. I mean, just in the, the um, arrangements of the thing. No, but th I mean, as, as for what is in the exhibition, they uh, certainly in this case they had nothing to say about it. We had a. I, I think you should understand that museums are really on guard against this. We had a certain situation recently where a corporation wanted involvement or censure to something we were doing, and I'm very proud of, of the people I work with, especially my trustees, because they said, give them the money back. And it would have meant the trustees would have had to assume the, the financial burden of the exhibition. They were very ready to. Well, they certainly assume the ethical burden. Mm -hmm. In the period, the three and a half years that you have been there, what is the, what you consider to be your greatest pleasure in being the director of that museum? Working with artists, I mean, there's, there is no greater pleasure or satisfaction. It sounds awfully maudlin, but there is no greater satisfaction than seeing Mark de Souvre erect a sculpture in Battery Park. I mean, the, that's the first time I'd ever seen one of those full-scale things in New York City. And to see Jasper working with us for two weeks on his exhibition. He was obviously profoundly involved in every aspect he of was, it. He was involved tremendously and willing to be involved. This isn't his business, putting on exhibitions. Are there any, ever any days when you wondered why you wanted the job in the first place? No, there never is. Well, other than money, what's your biggest single problem? Um, money. Money. <laughs> More money. money. <laughs> no, David, no, no, no. what's your plan next? I know you're going to guest curate another show. Will that, I hope, be at the Whitney? Mm-hmm. Can you mm -hmm. tell us the subject? No. No. Can you give us a No. Hint? No, we oh. can't. Now, Barbara Lee, back And off. on that teaser <laughs> note, two very special thanks. The one thing we know is whether we know the subject matter or not, it will be characterized by excellence with the collaboration of the two of you. Special thanks for being with us today. Tom Armstrong, director of the Whitney Museum. Okay. David Whitney, guest curator of the Jasper Johns exhibition at the Whitney. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and thank you, audience, for being with us, too. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> my